And thank you very much. Um, you might notice, let's see, let me get my slide. You might notice my accent is I'm from a small town called Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> if anybody has ever heard of that place. But let me tell you what got me involved in a lot of this. Several years ago, about 10 years ago, I was um, teaching at Florida State. Please notice I said Florida State. I know there's another Florida school that's really endearing to, the, to Tennessee. Nah, I don't like those guys. But anyway, I was teaching at Florida State and I was giving a lecture on preterm labor to a group of the first year of medical students that we had in the medical school that we developed. And you know, like in every class, there's always one, excuse my, Brooklyn's gonna come out, one pain in the ass student who is always asking questions. And he's always raising his hands. And I owe a lot of this, a lot of the epiphany that I had to this one medical student. And he said to me, he said, I don't understand you guys. I said, okay, you guys, I hate that term. I said, you guys meaning us from Brooklyn, us from maternal fetal medicine, what do you mean by us guys? He said, you know, I used to work in an ambulance. I used to work in the emergency room. Fact is, he didn't real, really work in the emergency room. He was, a, he was a volunteer for an ambulance. He said, when I would have patients that would get um, complained of chest pains, and we'd pick them up and we'd bring them to the hospital, doctors and nurses would jump on them. He said, we, they, they would try to prevent a heart attack. He said, when I'm in labor and delivery, watching a woman come in at 26 weeks contracting. They check her and her cervix doesn't change. She's not in labor. She's contracting, her cervix doesn't change. She's not in labor. Four hours go by, all of a sudden her cervix changes and now she's in labor and now the doctors and nurses start giving her medications to try to stop her from going into labor. He said, that's like waiting for a heart attack to happen and then you guys try to prevent it. And I, I did not have a comeback. I said, I'm sorry, what did you say? He said, yeah, you guys in obstetrics, you guys have some signs, some symptoms that may indicate prematurity, but you wait for labor to start and then you try to prevent it. Wouldn't it make more sense for you guys to start preventing it when you see something starting early and maybe you can prevent prematurity? You know, at that point in time in my career, 12 years ago, I was, you know, from University of South Florida, we believed that, that prematurity was an acute event. We gave them tocolytics, we stopped everything, we sent them home. We gave them steroids and all the things, but we sent them home. And all of a sudden it just occurred to me that you're right, you're absolutely right. And this kid was brilliant. In my mind, he is the only one out of that class that I, I don't think I convinced, but I mentored, and he was the only one out of that first year class that decided to go into OBGYN. And he's in Seattle, and I always go and visit him every time that I'm in Seattle. But he himself looked at all of the literature and he presented it to me, and he said, all of the data out there on randomized controlled trials required women to have cervical dilatation before they went into the trials. The average cervical dilatation was 3.6 centimeters. There were some women that were entered into trials that were four to five centimeters dilated to try to see if tocolytics worked or not. And of course, by then he said, labor has started. Why don't we look at something else? And that's when all of a sudden we started to get a lot more knowledgeable about cervical length, fetal fibronectin. And this is a great, great talk because it dovetails into what, what uh, David was talking about. We're in California, and well, one of the other things that he mentioned to me, and this was, this was the most amazing thing, you know there is not a single book that has ever taught us how to do a pelvic exam on a pregnant woman in labor. No books in midwifery, no books in OBGYN has ever taught us how to do a pelvic exam. So of course, maybe it doesn't happen in Tennessee, but here I am in Orlando, Florida, at Arnold Palmer Hospital for many years, now I'm with residents in Bayfront, I was with residents in Stanford. July comes, comes around, so we have a woman at 28 weeks or 30 weeks in triage. We have an intern going into evaluator. 
puts his gloves on, checks. Fingers are inside the vagina for about five minutes before a very seasoned nurse finally is looking at this kid saying, uh, what is she? Hold on, I'll be right back. So you gotta go, take your gloves off. I know, it doesn't happen here. <laughs> take your gloves off and you go to this little box of circles in labor and delivery. <laughs> and you put your fingers inside and say, oh, she's somewhere between two and six. <laughs> So of course, no, 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 get out, you know. So now I gotta get a more senior resident. No, first of all, the nurse says, no, she can't be two to six. She checks her, she's like, maybe my three. Okay, I didn't realize it was so subjective. My three is your one, <laughs> you know? Um, so no, she's my three. So let's get the senior resident to come over. So now the woman has had two pelvic exams. So then you get the senior resident coming over and says, no, nah, I think she's more like four, maybe five. Get the attending. All right, so now she's already gone through three pelvic exams. My point is we don't have a very subjective way of determining a woman who is really at risk until finally what some of, a lot of the things that David says I'm gonna again reinforce. We were in California, we started to look at this whole process of trying, we already had the 39 week initiative and then we have a perinatal quality insurance uh, group that met, met and said, hey, we have to define some way of, of, not a protocol, we're not gonna call it a protocol, we're gonna call it a toolkit to administer to all the hospitals in California to see if we can re identify women truly at risk for a preterm birth and identify those women that we don't need to spend a lot of resources on as far as, as pre prematurity. So again, the disclaimer, we're not, the March of Dimes is not engaged in rendering any medical device or recommendations. And let me tell you, this was a, you guys um, know Manny Porto, UC Irvine, and we had some spirited discussions because we were going to look at the March of Dimes and talking about fetal fibronectin, which is a commercial product. And although we're not endorsing the commercial product, and it has, I have no, as far as disclosures, nothing to do with Hologic, we basically had, you know, kind of like some, some issues with that. But the fact is that it is there. You've heard some good data on the use of fetal fibronectin and identifying women. So we started using that into our toolkit. And again, the goal of the preterm labor assessment toolkit is really to improve perinatal health outcomes. And we established a standardized clinical pathway. It's amazing to me that you can be, here I, I was in New York for many years, learning medicine in New York. Traveling down to Orlando, we all read the same books, but we practice medicine a bit differently. And it's always been a challenge to me and, and, and an interesting observation that if you want a group of physicians to really grow and, and develop, you take them from the same residency program keep them in the same location, and they thrive. You wanna see a group that can run into conflicts, you take one from New York, take one from California, take one from Texas, put them in Columbus, Ohio, and there's a culture clash. So we try to really identify just a pathway that everybody would reach a consensus, that everybody could identify, and really you know, buy into it to identify women at risk for preterm births. So we're gonna define the toolkit, which I did understand the scale and the impact of preterm birth, and I'm gonna have a different spin on it, and I want you to be a little bit open-minded about it, and understand how timely assessment can improve the neonatal outcomes by optimizing the care of those children before they're born. And again, we're not gonna stop prematurity. You've already heard David say, we're not gonna stop prematurity because of all the various factors, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of a different spin on it. Preterm births, you're already familiar with these numbers. You know the impact that it has. Uh, this is from the March of Dimes, 2011 live births, 11.7%. Late preterm, we're still struggling with that, 34 to 36 weekers, 8.3% of live births, or 328,000 babies are born in the United States. Early preterm, 3.4, 134,000 babies. This is astronomical. And my spin on it, and what we are trying to achieve at some point, once we get this toolkit up and going, is to really, and there be interventions that will prolong a gestation. If we can take, if we can identify 
interventions, and we're gonna hear about progesterone, for example. If you can identify women, and this is the first step that I'm gonna go through. If we can identify women at risk for a premature baby, we're probably, and we'll, we have to be honest with ourselves, we're not gonna stop that woman from delivering a premature baby. But I choose to take a, a page right out of the oncology textbook. If God forbid somebody gets cancer, oncologists, what do they give you? A five-year survival rate based on the interventions. Five-year survival rate. My argument is we should be looking at maybe prolonging gestation by an average of about six weeks. If we take a baby or a woman at risk at 24 weeks and intervene and deliver that baby at 30 weeks, think about the advantages of delivering that baby at 30 weeks. Yes, technically it's still gonna be a premature baby, but we have gained six weeks, but our mindset is not there yet. So hopefully starting off with this as a jumping point, we're going to identify women truly at risk and then come up with interventions that can prolong a gestation. In the United States, our risk has been going down, which is fantastic, 11.6%. This is, again, 2013 numbers. I was in Orlando, Florida from 2000 to 2010. I delivered, personally, 438 sets of triplets and four sets of quads. There was one day that I came to work, and we had, you know, it was just the IVF guys just were going crazy. And we had to finally sit down with them. We made it to the Today Show one morning because we delivered four sets of triplets and one set of quads in one day, and we bombarded the NICU. And I'm looking at this saying, this is nothing to brag about. What the hell are we doing? This is nothing to brag about. So in Tennessee, again, similar problems. We have a very high number of prematurity. But the numbers have come down. They've jumped up. They've, they've based on, on, on uh, ethnic groups, it's still the African Americans still lead, lead the pack with 17.1% here in Tennessee. And there are a lot of issues with that, and we're going to get into it. But the fact is that we did one thing in Orlando that really saved a tremendous amount of money. We got together with the reproductive endocrinologist at that point in time and said, look, these numbers are ridiculous and they now came down and all of a sudden started just putting one or two embryos inside that cut back significantly the incidence of prematurity, which was causing us tremendous problems. What are the consequences of, of prematurity? I'm not gonna go through this, you, you're already familiar with this. I am gonna point out something that a lot of people don't acknowledge. The average divorce rate in the United States is 50%, 50, 52%. Divorce rate among couples that have a child that's premature, that's probably going to have long-term consequences, is 78%. 78% of couples do not last more than three years after having a premature baby. It's incredible, and what happens is a lot of times these poor, poor families split up. The husband has a difficult time dealing with a premature baby. The wife is there attending to the child as much as possible in the NICU and it causes tremendous amount of strain that we really don't acknowledge very much, and I think we should acknowledge it. We already know the health impact, we know the economic impact, but the personal day-to-day -day impact that it has on these families is horrible. What are the causes of preterm birth? You've heard that there are different causes. Obviously, 40 to 45% is spontaneous. About a third of them is because of PPROM. Uh, you're gonna hear some good stuff about progesterone. We're all really encouraging the use of progesterone. Indicated, 30 to 35%, that is a number that keeps increasing because of the fact that our population is different than it was back in the 1960s and 70s. All of a sudden, we won't get into the ethics of it, but I have a 57-year-old currently pregnant in St. Petersburg, Florida. It's her eggs, too. <laughs> so... You can imagine what some of the consequences will be or, or the potential risks of that pregnancy are. She's very healthy otherwise, but nevertheless, taking a fifth, this is the oldest patient that I've ever had in my career, 57 years of age. And it's only one embryo, thank God. This is where we get into trouble, and again, trying to define prematurity, regular uterine contractions associated with cervical change. And again, I go back to the epiphany that I had with a med student. Digital exams are not that reliable, folks. It's not that reliable. One of the, most, one of the things that I did once I was giving Grand Rounds and, and Cornell, which is kind of like the mecca of prematurity management. That's where 
there was in the 1960s, okay, maybe I'm, I wasn't practicing the 1960s, but I'm dating myself. There was a, there was a chairman over there, Fritz Fuchs. And, but I remember in the 1970s being a med student, 70s and 80s, having to deal with something called an alcohol drip. That's where it came out of. Cornell University, Fritz Fuchs introduced alcohol. And so we were had, you know, I had to have a second, second in Latin, um, on my watch, I had to look at you know how many count the drops. Second hand on my watch, counting the drops, making sure that I didn't give this woman too much alcohol. But eventually, all these women got really inebriated, and then they were vomiting. They're they're everything up. So preterm labor, we know the definitions. They've been they've been drilled into our heads. We don't really have good way of determining. There was a time there that we, you know, we go through this exercise all the time. Do I put two fingers inside the cervix and stretch? Do I just have one finger and feel around it? And then my personal favorite is I ask a resident in July, you know, so what's, oh, she's about, she's still maybe one and a half centimeters. Damn, those are pretty good fingers. One and a half centimeters and about 50% effaced. 50% effaced. So you've obviously felt that cervix before she came in. Oh, no. Then how the heck do you know that she's 50% of what she... So you assume that every cervix is the same size. I said, should we assume that every... No, never mind. I won't go into that. <laughs> this, David gave another great example of different reasons. These are the four commonly accepted reasons as to why women go into prematurity. Premature labor, premature birth, the activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, inflammation, hemorrhage, and uterine distension. We're all familiar with this. You've heard about it. My spin on it, and one of the interesting things about it is that we, one of the things that we don't also don't acknowledge very much is the maternal fetal hypothalamic pituitary axis. We know about the fetus having a role in labor. What we don't give enough credence to is the role that stress plays on women to go into premature labor or women at risk for a premature birth, what can we do about those women? There's a great obstetrician by the name of Emile Paparniak in France many years ago. And he found that there was, their incidence of prematurity in France was, baseline was around 3%. All of a sudden it was jumping up to 7, 8, 9, 10%, almost similar to the United States. He found that there was a direct correlation between women entering the workplace and the incidence of prematurity. He was able to do some studies and convince the government that women, and France was the very first European country to do this. Yes, they can get away with it because it's a socialist country. The minute you get a positive pregnancy test, you go on complete disability. Their incidence of prematurity went down dramatically. You try telling a woman in labor, or I'm sorry, a woman who's pregnant, who's standing up at Walmart and is as cashier with twins or triplets, that she should at least sit down or you know, take a break. Walmart won't let her do that. She, they have a responsibility to stand up and be a cashier. And the stress that's put on that woman doesn't get recognized a lot. A lot. The reason I bring that up, well, the other interesting thing is that most European countries have adopted very similar laws. Now, Spain was the last country to do it, and what they've done is not starting off from the minute that you get a positive pregnancy test, but at 20 weeks, 24 weeks, you get complete disability. France has done, I mean, France and most European countries have done a very good job in reducing the incidence of prematurity. And I'm going to go back to this in a minute. Risk factors for preterm delivery, you guys are all familiar with it, previous preterm birth, obviously. The lifestyle environmental risks, we, make, we, we don't bring it that to, or we don't acknowledge that very much. Medical risks you're all familiar with. Risks of a subsequent preterm delivery. Again, we know the importance of having a history of a previous preterm birth. Your first pregnancy, full term, there's a 5% chance of having their subsequent pregnancy of having a preterm baby. If you've had two previous preterm births, there's a 33% chance a third of those women will have another premature baby. So please, those are some things that kind of like 
We are aware of those, we know the data, and we needed to identify those women, and you're gonna hear a lot about that, because we finally have some tools that may reduce the risks of those women, or will, does reduce the risks of those women having another premature baby. Interventions that do not reduce the risks of prematurity, bed rest, hydration, and pelvic rest. We're all familiar with that. I'm gonna step out of character for a minute and say, you know, I know I'm speaking for the March of Dimes, but it is very difficult, and we had, when we had this meeting, and I am, I was, at that time, I was in Central California, which is mostly an agricultural area. Everything that we eat, pretty much farming, came from, from that area of the country. And I remember looking at this slide and saying, okay, so I have a woman that came in at 26 weeks. She's, tw she's 26 weeks, she's got a short cervix, she has a positive fetal fibronectin. We gave her steroids, we've optimized that baby. So I'm gonna send her home. What do you want me to tell her? Well, she doesn't need to be on bed rest. She picks, she picks uh, lettuce on the field. And so their response to me, well, no, tell her not to go back to agriculture. Okay, she's got two other kids at home. Tell her to stay at home? Yeah. What should she do? Uh, just take it easy at home. <laughs> But how about bed rest? No, no, bed rest doesn't work. Well, when we speak of bed rest, we're not talking about an immobilized patient with you know, a hip fracture. They're taking it easy. That's another word for taking it easy. You know, it's, it's, we don't put them on complete bed rest. But we sort of, it, it, is a, it is a bar that we try to achieve. However, coming back to the issue of stress, there will be women that feel a lot, that are a lot more stressed out staying at home and dealing with all the challenges of being at home. And for those women, I really identify those women where I can reduce their stress. If their stress is gonna be staying at home, listen, as long as your job does not entail being a baggage handler at the airport, go back to work. It's okay, it's all right. You've got to identify women where they're going to be least stressful. Staying at home and dealing with my husband and those two other kids, no. I'd rather go back to work. Hydration, yes, we do know the benefits of hydration. Obviously, we want them to be hydrated, although it does not reduce the risks of prematurity, but can help with contractions, with contractions. Pelic rest, I love this, I love this. Again, probably not in, not in um, Tennessee, but, and here I am in Florida. I'm at the clinic with the residents, and I have, you know, they're all told she was in premature labor, risks of premature birth, she went home, residents gave her all the standard stuff. She comes into the clinic and she's sitting on one of those donuts for patients would have hemorrhoids. <laughs> I swear to God, I can't make this up. And I'm looking at her saying, is there a problem? Do you have a problem with hemorrhoids? She goes, no, they told me to do some pelvic rest and I just have to sit on this. <laughs> so, yes, a lot of people, you know, the educational, I don't know if it's the educational level, it may not be, they don't understand what pelvic rest is. So I grabbed all the residents, I said, guys, get rid of this nomenclature of pelvic rest. No vaginal intercourse. You can say it, we're OBGYNs. Don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed. Nothing inside the vagina. <laughs> okay, can you say that? Yeah, but you know, uh, they might get offended. What? talking about <laughs> they're gonna be offended. so pelvic rest makes a big difference <laughs> no pelvic rest so she's sitting she was honestly sitting on a donut that patients use for hemorrhoids I, I just had a laugh interventions that do reduce the risks associated with preterm birth progesterone which you're going to hear about cerclage in special limited situations preparing for preterm birth can improve outcomes people and that's what we're hoping for Antenatal corticosteroids, short-term tocolytic therapies to administer steroids and transport to a facility that can care for these children. Corticosteroids, you guys are all familiar with the benefits of corticosteroids. It's amazing to me that, where is it? Uh, despite 15 years of provider education efforts, only one of four very premature babies or one in four still fail to re receive steroids, which is amazing. And I don't, it's not geographic. We tried, you know, we've known about the benefits of steroids for how many years? 
And still, I, I was working as a consulting medical director for Matrio several years ago. And you know, in United Healthcare, we were doing some sort of case management. I got a group in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. They never used steroids. And on their premature babies, on their moms. And I call up the group, large group, 14 docs. Talk to the head guy, and I said, "Hey guys, you know there is, you know this this is nothing new. We've been doing this for quite some time." He goes, "Well, our babies don't need steroids; they do just fine." We had to do a lot of education there. We had to do a lot of education there. Contractions, a diagnostic challenge. Yes, contractions are not the end all. You've seen the data. You've seen the fact that there can be women with a lot of contractions. It's not. It's probably the least reliable. Uh, method that we have for determining women at risk. However, it's not completely, we can't completely ignore it, obviously. We had, you know, we had a lot of controversy. If you want to see a group of OBG or MFMs have a good debate, bring up home uterine activity monitor. Oh my God, we go back and forth and we're ready to strangle each other. And my take on it was always kind of semi funny because I said, wait a minute. So, if a woman calls me at three o'clock, there's a monitor in her house. If a woman calls me at three o'clock in the morning and says she's contracting, I shouldn't tell her, just put yourself on the monitor and see if you're really contracting? Uh, no, we now tell her, come to the hospital. And what's the first thing that happens in the hospital in triage? They put them on a monitor to see if she's contracting. And then they check them. So it's like, how come it works in the hospital and it doesn't work at home? Well, we can get into a whole debate about that. I think part of the problem, well, the big problem was that it was, it was marketed as a tool to prevent prematurity. No, it's not a tool to prevent prematurity. It just tells you what there may be symptoms that may indicate prematurity. And my argument, and I wrote a nice letter saying, look, that's like marketing a thermometer and saying it reduces infection. No, thermometers don't reduce infections. Thermometers tell you that there may be a fever that may indicate an infection or something else going on. So you seek medical attention, that's all. But management of preterm contractions, you overtreat a lot of low risk patients and you undertreat a lot of high risk patients. Again, some data out there. If contractions are confusing, what can we do? Without an event, without standardization, it's not a very good tool. 50 to 80%, you've seen all the numbers admitted for preterm labor or discharge and ultimately deliver at term, which standardized with standardization, we can reduce antepartum admissions and length of stay, reduce tocolytic therapy, which you've heard has some side effects, significant side effects, increased antenatal use that we don't do enough of, and we can save a lot of money. Again, you've seen this article before. We looked at this Bob Goldenberg study that was at the University of Alabama when he was at the University of Alabama, and we focused on cervical length and fetal fibronectin as two objective tools to identify women that we should be intervening on. Not saying that these women were going to go into labor, but they have a very high risk of going into labor. Especially if you've got somebody with a previous preterm birth and she comes in with symptoms and she seeks medical attention because of the contractions, and we find a short cervix and a positive FFN, those are the ones that would benefit from in, in terms of optimizing the care of that child by giving that woman steroids, neuroprotection, magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. So we came up with the pathway for improving outcomes. Basically, we look at women present to the hospital with signs and symptoms of preterm labor, cervical change or no cervical change. You know, that, that was, that's kind of like been the standardized way, but the appropriate patient assessment, we have got an arrow over here, is really to not rely so much on digital exams, although obviously she comes in with signs and symptoms of labor, and she's already four to five centimeters of labor. You've already, she's in labor, she is in labor. You call it preterm labor or labor, whatever. She is in labor. And we should try to optimize that very quickly for that child. And if you're in a level one or level two hospital, transfer that baby if she's having 26, 28 weeks, transfer it to a tertiary care center. We do digital exams, but try to, I would try, encourage you to discourage digital exams when it comes to really identifying women at risk. The value of standardized assessment, we identify those women truly at risk. I won't say labor, but they're at risk for a preterm birth. I prefer to use that term because, again, if their cervix is dilated, they are in labor. 
folks. They are in labor. When they're in term and we see somebody that's two centimeters, we call that a latency period. Well, now we're, we're starting to learn a lot more. And again, going back to labor, we can have women with a very prolonged latency period. And we can delay the delivery of that child. Uh, obviously, the problem is infection. The more digital exams, once you have somebody that's already somewhat dilated, three centimeters dilated, and she keeps getting pelvic exams, pelvic exams. You just keep putting more bacteria inside that endocervical canal, and eventually she's gonna start contracting, and you're not gonna be able to stop it. So be aware of that. So timely and appropriate interventions, optimal safety. We wanna hospitalize only those patients at greatest risk for preterm delivery, or transport them. And again, it's a consistent definition by clinical criteria as regular uterine contractions associated with cervical change, or we can do some other things, transvaginal sonograms or fetal fibronectin. If you have no access to a transvaginal sonogram at three o'clock in the morning, do a fetal fibronectin. You can do it blindly. You've heard that we have good data that you can do it blindly. It's very quick. Now, one of the problems and one of the, one of the concerns that a lot of the clinicians, a lot of the medical staff have is what do I do with it? You know, if, it's, if she's got a short cervix, what do I do with it? Because the data out there shows that with the short cervix, the positive predictive value is good, but it's not great. And you heard David talk about the synergy between the two tests. They both have a low false negative rate. So you've got a nice long cervix, you can be reassured. You've got a negative fetal fibronectin, the negative predictive value is very good. And people have always asked, well, what do we do with that? What do, what do I do with a short cervix? The analogy that I give them is, you know, we have some other, some tools called fetal surveillance. We have something called the non-stress test that has a high false positive rate, but a low false negative rate, very similar to fetal fibronectin. And so all of a sudden, you know, you see a strip that doesn't look reassuring. What do we do? We do another test, something called a biophysical profile. And the way that I tell my, my residents, and the way that I was taught to really drive the point home, it's very easy to make a good baby look bad. It's impossible to make a bad baby look good. So coming to, to identifying women at risk, you can make a woman who's contracting think that she's gonna have a premature baby. But once you've got these tests that are negative, you can reassure her, you can reassure yourself, and hopefully decrease the amount of stress that that woman is going through. But we know the value of cervical lengths. We know you've got to make sure that they also, one of, the, one of the things that we are running into, we have run into, is the proper way of doing a transvaginal sonogram. You can't push it in too far because you don't want to really image the, the thyroid. You want to back it off a little bit, <laughs> and you want to be able to take a look at the cervix. Oftentimes when you push it too, this is a great example, with an, abnormal, with an abnormal result, but if you push it in too hard, it squeezes the cervix closed. So all of a sudden you're looking at what looks like a normal appearing cervix. You've gotta back it off. And oftentimes what we'll do is we encourage it is to do a transfundal pressure to see if they have a dynamic cervix that all of a sudden with a simulation of a contraction, it opens up and it funnels all the way down and those patients are also at risk. Transvaginal sonograms invalid, be, be less than 15 weeks, greater than 28 weeks. Steep learning curve. Uh, you've gotta make sure you recognize what the landmarks are. Vaginal bleeding, in some instances, it's not contraindicated, but it can be contraindicated if, if there's significant vaginal bleeding. You may not be able to visualize everything, or you may be dealing with, with a previa. Central placenta previa is a relative contraindication, but again, the, the previa, in a sense, acts as a uh, organic cerclage. It, does, it keeps that cervix closed. They can start contracting. They can also start bleeding. Make sure the bladder is not filled. You don't want a full bladder to be able, because again, a full bladder will compress that cervix and make it look, a funnel cervix, make it look like it's a normal cervix. Predicting the ability of prematurity based on transvaginal ultrasounds. You've already f saw some of the data. This just confirms it. Again, cervical length of 
15 millimeters is associated with a 16% risk of delivery prior to 32 weeks, while a 45 millimeter length is, has only a 1.5 chance of a preterm delivery. So there is something to, to, to be said about fetal fibronectin and cervical lengths. We look at both of those tools as, as a guide to identify women at risk. Fetal fibronectin, it's a glue. It's a glue that gets expressed very early on when the amnion is being adher becoming adherent to the chorion and the decidual, and again, later on in the gestation, 36, 37 weeks, as a woman is preparing to go into labor, it gets expressed. Um, in between, you saw some great slides from David. Uh, it's a great tool to be able to identify, again, women at risk, but the question comes up, what do you do with a positive one? Do a transvaginal sonogram. If the cervix is nice and long, you can be somewhat reassured. Not completely, you are not gonna completely ignore it, but you're gonna be a little bit more conscientious of that woman who came in symptomatically with contractions. Her cervix is nice and long, but that overrides the positive fetal fibronectin for the most part. <laughs> Contraindicated, um, sterile speculum exam, I have to say, is the only FDA approved collection method, but they are applying for FDA approval for, for non-speculum exam. Vaginal bleeding, definitely do not do it prior in the course. Oh God, this one also kills me. You know how many times people will tell you, no, I've not had intercourse, no. And so, you know, we got residents who do slides and I wanna see if there's any, you know, ferning or I wanna see if there's any clue cells and Dr. Fuentes, there's a bunch of things swimming around in here. I said, did she have sex? No. All right. Well, some spontaneously, they just managed to invade her vagina. Uh, well, my mother was in the room. I didn't want to, I felt embarrassed. And I'm like, okay, all right. Cervix greater than three centimeters, do not do a cervical, uh, do not do a fetal fibronectin. It's already, the, 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 the gig is up. She's already at risk. Bulging fetal membranes and P-prom, there's a lot of fetal fibronectin in, am in amniotic fluid. And so be aware that whenever there's bulging membranes, um, there's sort of like that transudative fluid. Fluid somehow leaks out that sometimes gives you the impression that she's ruptured her membranes. But you can see sometimes, if you do a good speculum exam and she's got a bulging membrane, you can see some of the little droplets of amniotic fluid right there on the amnion. And it falls into posterior fornix. You do a fetal fibronectin, it's going to come back positive because there is a lot of fetal fibronectin in, uh, in that in that area. Scale, I hopefully I've impressed upon you the scale and the impact of prematurity. You've already heard that great talk from, from David. We have to standardize it. The standardization is basically, I don't know if you're gonna be able to read all of this, but really I'll, I'll put it in a nutshell and we're gonna have, please con contact us with the March of Dimes. There's an algorithm that we have posted in all labor and delivery triage areas and identifying women who come in, symptomatic women, and the first thing we do is we collect a fetal fibronectin. We don't send it, collect a fetal fibronectin, and do a digital exam. She's three centimeters dilated, don't bother sending it, she's already at risk, you don't have to send it. But if, it's, if you're, the only access is a fetal fibronectin, that's fine, send it. If she's positive, that's a woman that has some reason to be concerned. We need to have a reason to be concerned about in the algorithm. Back it up with a, fetal, with a transvaginal sonogram. If the, cervical, if the transvaginal sonogram is short and she's got a fetal fibronectin, that woman really needs to be treated with steroids and, and antibiotics and also magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. If the cervix is nice and long, it's left up to the physician's discretion as to how aggressive you want to be. She may not necessarily need to be hospitalized if you're able to control her contractions, uh, but she may not have the same risk if her cervix is nice and long. Or if the cervix is short and she's got a negative fetal fibronectin, it's going to be left up to the physician's discretion as to which one are you going to, which, which method are you going to follow. But for the most part, just be aware, as I mentioned to you, that it's very easy to make a woman look like she's gonna have a premature baby, all right? An asymptomatic, or not a say, but a, a woman who has a negative predictive value with both of those tests. But a woman who's got symptoms and she's got those short cervix, positive FFN, be aware of those women. Those women, and now once we get identified those women, we are able to do that, 
the next phase that we're hoping to do is what kind of interventions can we do to these women? We know we're familiar with maintenance tocolytics and the debate about maintenance tocolytics, but maybe maintenance tocolytics is not that bad. It may not, it may not be only for 24 hours. It may be that if you can, we've learned the benefits of vaginal progesterone in a woman with a short cervix. We're prolonging the gestation. It may be that you get somebody at 26 weeks and administer some maintenance tocolytics with a short cervix and a positive fetal phyronectin, and you may delay that delivery for another four or five or four to six weeks. She's still gonna be a premature, ba premature birth, but man, think about the advantages. Hopefully I've impressed upon you a little bit different spin on it, and I thank you very much for your attention, and I will answer your questions later. <laughs>